Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to the conclusion of Panko 97. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your promises, we thank you for everything you have revealed to us since we came here. And we are praying that through all these things and your hand in our lives, our anchors we hold in Jesus' name. And we pray, O oh Lord, you'll see us through to the very end. We pray that none of us will fall by the wayside. And we're asking, O oh Lord, your hand will hold us will be faithful to the very end. And when the trumpet shall sound, and the saints of God will be going on home, we pray that every one of the, us will be counted with them in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We thank the Lord for coming to this point in Icon 97. And as we look at the final message, asking the question, will your anchor hold? I want to remind you of the passage we started with, Mark chapter 4, verse 35, in connection with Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Mark 4, 35. And the same day, when the evening was come, he says unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. Those eight words, how important they are in our lives. Jesus said, Let us pass over unto the other side. He didn't just say, You pass over unto the other side. He's inviting you is starting a communion, companionship, and it's like he calls you into his company. And he says, hand in hand together, you see that other side, that's actually where we're going. Now, brace up. Now, make up your mind. And let us move on together. Don't move ahead of God, ahead of Christ. And don't come far between step by step together let us pass over onto the other side and then in chapter 5 verse 1 and they came over onto the other side they came over onto the other side i pointed it out to you already that between the initial call and the final consummation a lot of things happened and in our lives too, between the initial call and the final consummation and the climax, there will be a lot of things that will happen. But if you will get onto the other side, there are some things you need to have in mind. And already we know it's possible to get to the other side. And we know it's possible for our anchor to hold as we sweep through the Bible. And you remember some people that the Lord had given promises to. And he gave them that initial call. And then you look at all their lives. And you look at the climax, the consummation, and the final thing that happened to them. There will be no doubt in your mind that actually 
they held on to the very edge. But there are some things you'll find in their lives. Let me just remind you of some of the people you think about Joseph. And you know that that man, although there were difficulties in his way, and everything seemed to work against him, and you would have thought that he will not be able to hold on. Yet, we can see the history of his life and see the final scene, and you'll see that the anchor was holding. How about Samuel? The environment was very bad. The sons of Eli were very immoral and idolatrous, and uh, they, will, they were uh, very much in uh, immorality. And yet, you will know that Samuel, he was like the white lily growing out of the dirty mud, and there was no stain of the mud upon his life. How about Job? You think about Job, immediately you think about problem. You think about uh, sickness. You think about affliction. And yet you know that his anchor held fast. You think about David. So many problems in his life. From the time he slew Goliath. Then Saul was after him. And it appeared that what the Lord had said about him will not be fulfilled. But you know the story yourself. Think about Ruth. Think about Anna. Think about Elizabeth. Think about some women in the Bible. They held on fast. And you cannot think of the New Testament without thinking of Paul the Apostle. And his anchor held fast. But now, I must uh, bring your mind back to what we've been going through in our morning sessions this week. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When you think of anchor holding fast, those people... They had something within them. They had something in their heart. I think they had something in their mind. I think they had something in their head too. I dare say they had something flowing within their even blood system in their veins. That there was no iota of negative thought of ever thinking that they could not make it, those people, they were bold for the Lord. There was a kind of spirit within them. And if you could summarize and get through all the things we talked about, about Daniel, about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you had that same thing within you, I'm sure that when we get to the other side, will not be looking before we see you. You'll be conspicuously present there. Now, I'm going to summarize before I get to the points of the message today. Seven things you need. And I see this from the lives of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that we've studied already. You are thinking of your anchor holding fast. You are thinking of now you have started and to be able to finish. You are thinking about the fact that now you are missed the people of God and you want to be there until the trumpet will sound. You are singing with us here on earth. You want to sing with us in heaven. Seven things that you need. Now you understand. When I give you some of these points, I use uh, what we call alliteration. That is, I will make the word start the same way. I do that so as to help your memory. I think one of these days in our Congress, we should talk about uh, how you study and how you are able to get something and retain it. And I do these things deliberately to be an aid to your memory. When you link up uh, the words we are talking about, if you remember the first one, and then you see the way they sound and the way they are spelled and the way they look, it helps your memory. So I'm not just doing it for fun. I do it deliberately. I'm sure you know that already. Number one is conversion. You see, if you are really going to hold on to the end, how can you hold on to the end without conversion? You are no more dead in sins and trespasses. There is something in your life that is coming from heaven. It's an eternal thing. In fact, it's called eternal life. It's a spiritual thing. It's spiritual life. It's something coming from God himself, from the creator of the heavens and the earth, and it drops in your soul, in your heart. Conversion, number two. Conviction. 
Well, a lot of people running about, I'm converted, I'm converted, I'm converted. The problem with them is that although they might be converted, there is no conviction. And I'm telling you that if there is no conviction with the conversion, you are not going to get very far in the Christian life. If you don't stand for something, you will fall for everything. You know, you have no principle. You don't have any conviction. You don't say, on this point, on this principle, on this precept, I stand. And even if there were as many demons, as many evil spirits, as there are slaves or of asbestos on the roof, I will still be holding on because I have conviction. If you don't have conviction, you'll be a wishy-washy Christian. You'll be so flexible that every wind will be blowing you. There will be no backbone at all. In fact, you'll not be able to place you and say, this is where to find him and this is where to locate her. Therefore, number two, there is conviction. Number three, there is what we call commitment or consecration. I pick the word consecration. There is consecration. You consecrate your life. You lay everything upon the altar, and then you say, Lord, here am I, come what may. I am going to follow the Lord until the very end. Number four is courage. And you've seen that in Daniel. You've seen that in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You've seen that in Paul the Apostle. How were they able to hold on? When we talk of your anchor holding fast, whatever the storm, Whatever the wind, whatever the billows, there is courage. And then you've learned uh, from the life of uh, Daniel and from the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, consistency. Consistency. That is a constant thing that's always there. And uh, we can predict you because you are consistent. You believed yesterday, you are believing today, and we can judge from the past and the present, and the summary, the totality of the qualities and characteristics in your life. We know we're going to find you believing tomorrow because there is, a, there is something, a continuum. There is something that is uh, all in your life, whatever else is there, whatever problems you are going through, whatever victories you are having, whatever it is, there is something that is always there. And there is a consistency about you. Because of that, we know that you are going to hold on till the very end. Now, this new uh, one uh, I'm introducing now, uh, I didn't mention any of uh, this last two now during the message. Some of these other ones I've mentioned already in the messages. But now number six is a conquering spirit. A conquering spirit. That's the spirit that says, Satan, heat the fire. Seven times more. You'll never find me bending, bowing, cringing, submitting myself to you. Do what you will. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And I know that after all these things, after all the winds are blown, you will find me standing. If you think that because you are hitting the flame, and you think you are hitting the furnace, if you think I'm going to bend, if you think I'm going to bow, if you think I'm going to cringe, if you think I'm going to backslide, you have the biggest joke of your life. I am going to keep on standing and standing on what I believe no matter how hot the flame, the fire may be. That's a conquering spirit. That's a person that you really know the devil doesn't know what to do with a man like that. And now number seven is conformity to Christ. Conformity to Christ. You are looking at Christ. He is your example. He is your pattern. He is your model. And in everything you do, you ask yourself, what will Christ do in this situation, in this circumstance? What will Christ do? And you are following Christ. I'm following Christ. I'm following Christ. And if there's conformity to Christ in your life, in the time when you face your Gethsemane, there's a conformity to Christ. In the time when you are facing temptation from the devil, there's conformity to Christ. In the time when everybody, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're looking for a way to trap you and trick you and make you fall. 
there's conformity to Christ. In the time when you are disappointed by your nearest friend, closest friend, by Judas Iscariot, somebody who has a, who has part in your life, a part in your life, for all these years, you are conformed unto Christ. You see, if that conformity to Christ is in your life, that no matter if you are up, if you are down, if you are on the mountain, if you are in the valley, if you are working miracles, if you are praying, if you are eating, if you are having quiet time, if you are in Gethsemane, or if you are in the Mount of Transfiguration, anywhere you are, there is a conformity to Christ. Nobody needs to tell you that you are going to make it to the end, because that is what it takes. Review, revise, summarize again. Number one, what's number one? I just want to make sure you took the notes. Number two, and number three, and number four, and number five, number six, number seven. Now the message of today, as we're talking about, uh, we're talking about your anchor holding. And I'm very sure you cannot hear all this and remain the same again. There is a change already. There is uh, something different already. And I'm telling you, the devil is going to have a hard time knowing what to do with you. You will trouble him. You will torture him. You will frighten him. You will put him on the run. You will command him. You will say, here I stand, you devil and demons. I want you to run a relay race right now. And I blow the whistle. And when you hear one, two, three, go. You will put the devil on the run in Jesus' name. I'm telling you that on the campus, something is going to happen. Because, you know, you cannot have a lot of people like this who have become miracle workers yourself. You have not only received miracle, you have not only seen the power of God, that power of God is your life already. And you take that power, you take that anointing, and you take that miracle working ability of the Holy Spirit, you take it back to the campus, I'm telling you something is happening already. And the kingdom of the devil is shaking already in Jesus' name. Now there are four things we're going to talk about. Number one is desire. Desire. Now, since we've been here during this uh, Anchor 97, what desire do you have within you? And then number two, decision. And then number three, determination. Number four, discipline. Remember what we're talking about? We're talking about your anchor holding fast. Your anchor holding fast. And these are the basic things we need. The basic ingredients by which to make our lives stand firm. And the anchor to hold fast. Number one is the desire. And uh, I want to point out to you in the lives of some people in the Bible. The kind of desire that they had. And this was the kind of thing that made them to be able to hold on. And really they held on fast. Even to the very end in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. In verse 10, it says that I may know him. Paul the apostle says, if you want to know my desire, my spiritual desire, the consuming passion, the thing that drives me, the thing that motivates me, the thing I wake up in the morning and I say, oh Lord, remember, don't forget, this is my goal in life. This is what I want to be. This is what I want to do. This is the thought, the waking thought and the sleeping thought and the thing that moves my life and makes me feel that my existence has a purpose. There are some people that just exist. They just live. They wake up in the morning. There is no desire. There is no goal. There is, not, there is no future target. They are after. They are just there. There is nothing to say that this is how significant their lives will be. And they are just barely living. And they are passing through time. And they make no mark on life. But Paul the apostle said, I don't want to be like that. There is only one life to live. And I want that life to count. Paul, if you have only one life, just like we do, and that life is going to count, 
What do you count as the most important thing in your life? So that you'll be able to hold on to that thing and your anchor will hold to the very end. And Paul says the number one thing is desire. A man that doesn't have any desire is a dead man. He's dead already. There is no motivation for life. There is no goal in life. There is nothing he's running after. There is nothing he's praying for. There is nothing he aims to get. It's just a dead fellow waiting for burial. Therefore, number one thing, there must be desire. A strong desire, a spiritual desire, a dynamic desire, a kind of desire that goes beyond you, goes beyond what you are now goes beyond what you have achieved now because you're always aiming at it. Always aiming at it. Always aiming at it. That is the desire that will make you to be standing, verse 9, and to be found, verse 10, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. He says, I know that power already, but I want that power to so increase and so increase, it will come to the level of the power that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. He says, this is my desire. I want to look at Christ and look at myself. If I still find any difference between me and Christ, there is no total conformity yet. Therefore, I walk on it more. I pray on it more. I consecrate more. I submit myself more. And then I look at the image of Christ and I look at myself and I still see a difference. And then I know I've not got to where I'm going. I'm still going to make more progress. And I walk on it more. And I pray on it more. It says, until I'm made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain. Attain. There was something he was reaching forward to get that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead and then you say but paul you are saved you are sanctified you are baptized in the holy ghost you are preaching already you have even worked miracles and you are reaching epistles and people know that already you are a useful instrument in the hands of god why don't you rest now isn't that enough he said, my desire is bigger than what you have mentioned. And therefore, I do not see myself as having attained anything, as having arrived in verse 12, not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect. Oh yes, he was perfect in some sense. He was imperfect in another sense. But I follow after. I follow after. I am stretching myself. I am longing. I am desiring. There is something, a big picture in my mind. And I'm looking for that big picture. And you know the people that backslide? The people that are not able to hold on? They are the people that are not reaching forth for anything. Holding on to anything. And there is no goal in their lives. And there is no desire. There is nothing they are longing after. There is nothing they are reaching onto. There is nothing they want to grab. And there is no spiritual height they really want to attain. They are just the so-so Christians. Are you born again? Praise the Lord. I am born again. What are you going to do for the Lord? Well, isn't it wonderful? I'm just born again. Are you doing anything in the campus fellowship? You are talking of campus fellowship. I'm telling you to even be born again. You didn't, you have not known. The road it took me to traverse, that is to go on until I became born again. In fact, I am resting here now. They talk about sanctification. They talk about Holy Ghost baptism. They talk about evangelism. They talk about casting out devils. They talk about even raising the dead. They talk about cleansing the lepers. They talk about healing the sick. But, you know, I don't know why they are so serious about some of these things. And they are too zealous about it. Me, I'm just happy and grateful to God as I am. After all, I am born again. And there are thousands of other people who are not born again. Since I'm born again, I'm even better than all those people. A dead Christian. Dead log of wood. No thought. 
no desire, no aspiration, no ambition, no goal. Nothing is reaching forward to. I don't want to be like that. Do you? Do you want to be like that? See Paul the Apostle. He said, with all I've got, with all I've attained, he said, neither were already perfect. He said, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which I also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark. I like that pressing spirit. That eager spirit. The spirit that wakes up today and says, Praise the Lord for the exploits of yesterday. Exploits of last week. Exploits of last month. Praise the Lord for the achievement of last year. But as I wake up today, a new day, a new opportunity. Now this new day, I want to forget everything I've ever done. I'm now having the pressing spirit, the eager spirit, the concrete spirit, and I'm pressing forward for the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I pray you will be like that. I said I will I pray you will be like that. There must be a desire in your heart. I'm going to go to number two. And number two is decision. When you get that kind of desire, and there is something within you that is moving you, that is driving you, there's something within you that makes you wake up in the night and read the Bible. Wake up in the night and pray. Or get up early in the morning and you read the Bible and you are not satisfied with the little things you are getting from the Bible and you say, I need Bible help. I need Bible age, I need commentary, I need Bible dictionary, I need something because I don't want to just read the Bible superficially. I don't want to be ordinary Christian. In fact, I don't want to be ordinary anything. I don't want them to use the word ordinary about my life. Ordinary student, ordinary Christian, ordinary member of campus fellowship. I don't want to be ordinary kind of uh, ordinary fellow. I want to be extraordinary in my life. When you compare me with other people, I want them, while they say, Miss so-and-so, Mr. so-and-so, Miss so-and-so, Mr. so-and-so, when they get to me in whatever field, in my studies, in my discipline, in my Christian life, in my understanding of scripture, in my prayer life, in anything I do, after they have been discussing and talking about others, when they get to me, I want them to be able to find something extra they will talk about. Extraordinary. That they will say, now we'll be talking about their own a meal, about the every dick and Harry, about the ordinary people. Now we come to so and so. We don't know what to call him, whether a spiritual genius or a scientific genius or arts a genius or academic genius. We know there is something extra in his life. That extra you will get in Jesus' name. Hey, there must be a decision in your life. A decision that there must be something added on top of what everybody has attained, what everybody else has got, that that extra, extra, extra will be in your life and it will be so. And uh, that brings us, as I said, to number two, decision. Now, you need to really get into decision. That's what Elijah was calling the people to. In 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. And in verse 21. 1 Kings 18, 21. And Elijah came unto all the people. And said, How long halt ye between to opinions. You see that indecision, it affects so many people in so many areas of their lives. 
They're not able to make any headway at all in life. He gets to school. It's not even decided yet what course he wants to follow. And he's oscillating between department A and department B. By the time he makes up his mind, we have already gone through the basic principles. We've done the review of what they did last year. By the time he makes up his mind, we've gone so far, he has a lot of notes to copy. And then he gets to that department eventually, and really there's no firm decision. And without everything going on there, and the heat there, academically, he feels, I don't think I can make it here, I need to go to another faculty. By the time he gets there, he discovers that the people have gone very far. In coming back to the department he left, they have re removed his name from the department. He is now hanging. He's a university student without belonging to any department or faculty. Indecision. And you see there are people in major things in life. The problem is they never really decide. And you see, if, if you take the first decision and you follow the Lord Jesus Christ to become a Christian... That's going to really solve a lot of problems in your life. And then you understand the problem of indecision is a great problem that can make you a mediocre in life. It can make you a mediocre in the Christian life. can make you a mediocre in the academic life. can make you a mediocre in almost everything that you do. Therefore, come to a decision. And Elijah said, how long now are you people hanging, halting, oscillating, between two opinions, if the Lord be God, follow him. And if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. But thank God. I said, thank God. Elijah led them eventually to a wonderful decision. And I'm sure before you leave this place, there must be a decision in your life. How could you come this far and you have never even taken a decision what career you are going to follow? How can you come this far and you have not taken the decision what kind of student you are going to be? How can you come this far in your educational career? And you have never really taken a decision. I'm not, I'm not talking of a decision down there. A decision that is so low. That doesn't take any effort to even reach it at all. I'm talking of a decision up there. That you will need a ladder to climb. To get there. A decision there. That you will need lead. Spiritual lead. Operated by the electricity coming from heaven that you'll need to be able to get. That's what I'm talking about. How can you come this far and you have not taken a decision in your spiritual life? You know, some Christians, the only decision they have taken and they have sung that song until the song has lost meaning. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Uh -huh. There you are. He has decided to follow Jesus. No quiet time. No prayer life. No evangelism. No holiness. No sanctification. Nothing in his life to terrify the devil. There is no courage. There is no conviction. There is no conformity to Christ. There is nothing. You, you look at him and then the other students will point at him and say, there is one of them going there. It's one of them. But you know, it just say, you know, so, so Christian, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turn. And the devil never bothers about him. Never bothers about her because the decision doesn't really mean anything in the kingdom of God. We will come out of that this morning in Jesus name. And so the people answered him, not a word, but today you will answer. I said you will answer decision is the thing you see there is a desire and the desire is up there it's very very high and then you decide you say lord help me i'm not for the ground i'm not for the valley i am for the scene up, up there and i'm getting there 
and I'm going there and I'm attaining it and I'm obtaining it and I'm going to hold on to it and nothing will take it away from me. You take a decision and hold on to that thing and nothing can shake you away from it and you will not be shaken away from it in Jesus' name. In Ruth, Ruth chapter 1, you know this, but I need to read it to you. This is real decision. Ruth chapter 1, and in verse 16, and Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Isn't that a decided heart? A decided lady. A decided woman. A decided Moabite. The decision had been taken. There was a desire. The goal had been set. He, she knew where she was going. A decision had now been taken and said, Where you go, there I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. If you will take a decision like that, blessings are going to come upon your life. Determination. You know, you have a desire, and these things I'm talking about, you apply it to your spiritual life, apply it to your academic life, Apply it to what you ought to be in life. There is a desire. There is a decision. Now, there is a determination. This is the fiber within that really makes you very strong. That determination. We came across that when we saw Daniel. Now, because if you see Daniel, if you were able to see Daniel... You just look at his face. You are going to see determination there. If you see Daniel, and you see Daniel just walking, look at his steps, look at the way he carries himself, and look at the way he moves on, he's like a determined man. If you see Daniel in a conversation, and that Daniel is talking to the messenger and the steward of Nebuchadnezzar, and he's making a particular request, you are going to see in that conversation of Daniel, you are going to see determination. If you see Daniel, just look at Daniel. In the midst of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they are just discussing together, sharing together, sharing their lives together, and what their lives will be in Babylon because they have been taken away out of their land. Watch Daniel in his uh, communication, interaction with his companions and friends, you are going to see determination. If you see Daniel, he got sick, perhaps, and then Nebuchadnezzar was still there. Oh, you can see determination in his language. I'm not going to die now. I must outlive Nebuchadnezzar. And it was so. And Belshazzar was there. I must outlive Belshazzar. And then Darius came. I must outlive this Darius, I'm talking about a man that through his life, you couldn't catch him with determination absent in his life. You know, if the devil can catch you anytime, if the devil can catch you anytime, and determination is missing in your life, I don't know what will happen. I pray we'll never catch you like that. But you know, when you catch a man with determination, when the wind comes in the life of a man, before that wind, determination was there. That makes him to have backbone. He is planted upon the rock. And he looks at the wind in the face and he says, wind, blow as hard as you can. There is something you will find deep down covered by flesh and bone. They call it determination. There is no wind. There is no storm that can bring a man of determination that can bring him down. And I appeal to you. With all that you can get, get determination. You will not easily give up. You will not know what they call difficult subject. You will not know what they call an impossible career. 
You will not know what they call a difficult department. You will not know what they call a difficult faculty. If there is determination within you. And there will be no part of a Christian life. That you will find so difficult and say, you know, my problem is that this sanctification, I really cannot get it. In fact, now, I've decided not to even worry myself because I failed, I failed, I fell, I fell. There's no determination. I read of an individual, even a non-believer, non-Christian. And uh, he had a determination, a, a concept within him, something he was going to do. And then he got the first job, he lost it. Got a second job and lost it. And got a third job and lost it. And he said, doesn't matter. I know I'm still going to top all the people ahead of me in this profession. He got the fourth and the fifth and lost them. He got the sixth and the seventh and the eighth and he lost them. He got the ninth to the twelfth and he lost them. He was fired. He was terminated 18 times. And they were telling him by every letter of termination, you don't have what it takes in this area. You don't have the ability to pursue this sin. You are a failure in this area. After the 18th failure, he got a 19th job. Still, he will not even change the subject. He will not even change the career. And do you know, he climbed to the top in that career and now he's above every other person that have been ahead of him. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about determination. I pray you will have it. I said, I pray you will have it. How can you come to a conference like this? How can you come to a place like this? And you go back wish you wish you without determination. I believe you have it already. I said you have it already. Uh, we, we're keeping Daniel within Daniel chapter 1 and in verse 8. Daniel 1 verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Determination. Daniel purposed in his heart. That he will not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the priests of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You have that kind of determination. If you have that kind of determination, you will see that things will change in your life. Of course, you know that Paul the Apostle, he was such a man. Uh, you need to study more about Paul. Read more about Paul. And see the kind of material metal he was a uh, mage of. In um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 20 and verse 24. Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me. That's the language of a determined man. A determined woman. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life down to myself. So that I might finish my cause with joy. And the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. We'll come to number four. Discipline. Discipline. We say your desire. You've taken a decision. And you are determined. But if you, are, if you lack discipline. Every other thing will fall apart. You will not be able to make anything. You need self-control. You need self-discipline. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest by any means when I have preached unto others, I myself should be a castaway. Discipline. Bring your tongue under control. Bring your eyes under control. Bring your body, members of your body, under control. Bring your mind, your thoughts, under control. Even the places you go, be very, very selective. And know that you are not just an ordinary brother, ordinary sister. And people don't want to achieve the kind of thing you want to achieve. 
The people who want to go on record that their lives are not ordinary but extraordinary. They are very selected people. And uh, they are selective in the things they do, in the things they say, in the company in which you'll find them. And they are the people, their eyes are always looking at the thing that they want. And therefore, you make sure that everything is under real control. You're sleeping, that should be under control. You sleep appropriately, but you don't oversleep. Even your eating, that should be under control. Everything that you do, the relationships, the friends that come into your life should be under control. The visitations should be under control. Even the reading, you select your books and so select your friends. Because a bad book can do as much harm, in fact more damage, than a bad friend. Therefore, you bring everything under control and you say now, I keep under my body. I bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I preached unto others, I make myself a castaway. Now, if you will keep to these things, and you'll pray that the Lord will help you, and you are converted, and you have conviction, and you are committed and consecrated to the Lord, and there is courage in your life, you don't say there's a lion in the way. I cannot go to the place I need to go. You don't, see there's, you don't say there's an impediment, a hindrance on my way. I cannot get to the place I ought to get to. If there is consistency, and if you have within you a conquering spirit, and every time, whether it's at Gethsemane, or it is on the Mount of Transfiguration, whether it's in the church or in the classroom, there is conformity to Christ and there is an overruling desire in your life that you cannot wake up and not think of what the Spirit of God will make you to become. And you have taken a decision that not any wind or storm can change. And there is a determination very similar to that of Daniel. That just looking at you will see that you are a determined believer. If you bring in discipline on top of everything. And you bring yourself under the control of the spirit of God. And you say, I will make it. You will make it. You will make it. If the population of demons will double, doesn't matter, you are going to make it. I'm sure you will make it. You know, as a result of these points I gave you, if you will hold on to this point, and you will walk on this point, in a few years' time, when we see one another again, you'll be able to look back from the time when the Lord said, let us pass over onto the other side. We'll be sharing testimonies together of coming to the other side. Uh, do you see yourself on the other side already? Can you imagine? Can you visualize? Can you see that in all the storms, in all the wind, with all the devils on the way, with all the negative things on the way, can you see yourself on the other side already? Stand up and tell the Lord I'm on the other side already. I will get there. I will make there. There is nothing that will make a shipwreck of my faith. Or make a shipwreck of my life. Or make a shipwreck of my family. Or make a shipwreck of my career. I'm on the other side already. It's just a matter of time. It will be manifest. It's just a matter of time. It will be seen. It's just a matter of time. It will be known. Whatever needs to be corrected will be corrected. Whatever needs to be worked on will be worked on. I'm going to be extraordinary. I am going to be extraordinary. Do you have conversion? Any conviction? Any
any consecration at all? Any courage to face life? And make your life meaningful? Any courage in your Christian life? To stand against temptation? And not be a wishy-washy, fecal, feeble Christian? Any consistency at all? You have a conquering spirit. You have a heart and mind to be totally conformed unto Christ. Desire. Decision. Determination, discipline.